Welcome everyone to today's Foxconn Quantum Computing Seminar. Today we have the pleasure of having Kenneth Goodenough. Uh, he will talk about this bipartite entanglement of noisy stabilizer states through the lens of uh, stabilizer codes. So Kenneth is a postdoc in quantum communication theory. He is currently working with uh, Professor Don Towsley uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. In his PhD, he was working with uh, David Alcos at QTech, where he worked on uh, near-term repeater schemes, distillation, and error correction. And his main interests are in the mathematical structures behind uh, noisy quantum systems to understand uh, what we can do with near-term quantum devices. So, uh, Kenneth, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction and uh, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, let me first start by saying that this is joint work together with uh, some very nice people from the University of Maryland, uh, University of Arizona, and uh, Cisco and the Center for Quantum Networks. Uh, and the second thing I want to say is, is that I will be writing uh, on my slides during this talk and have very bad handwriting. So if at any point something is not clear, whether that's either the presentation or my handwriting, feel free to let me know and uh, I won't be too offended uh, if my handwriting is bad. So yeah, please let me know. Um, like the title says, the talk, I will talk about noisy bipartite entanglement. Uh, and that was sort of our initial goal. We wanted to understand noisy bipartite entanglement. But uh, what I think is most interesting is sort of the tools and this viewpoint that we use to solve this problem. And I think it's these tools that we developed or that we use that are most interesting also to other researchers. So I don't want to focus too much on the problem itself, but more on the tools that we use. In other words, it's uh, it's more about the journey than uh, than the destination. All right, let's uh, get started. Uh, let me start with some soft vision. In uh, in the future, let's say uh, let's be very optimistic. Let's say in uh, five years quantum network, and uh, we will be able to distribute perfect quantum states to end users. All right, so we have some perfect state. Now, that would be very nice if we could really just distribute a perfect state like this. But unfortunately, we're not five years into the future yet, uh, and so our state will be imperfect. So we add some form of imperfections, and then a very natural question is, given these imperfections, how good or useful is this state? Now, of course, this is a very general state, and one encounters all kinds of flavors of this question all the time. So let me specialize the setup a little bit more. Instead of starting with an arbitrary perfect state, I'm going to start off with a stabilizer state. Now, from what I've understood, uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with the stabilizer formalism. So if you have no idea what a stabilizer state is, I will try to give a brief motivation introduction later. Um, but of course, I can only explain so much in uh, in uh, in uh, this talk. OK, now we start with the perfect stabilizer state. We add imperfections. In my case, I'm going to be interested in the case of Pauli noise. And I'll explain later on what I mean with this. And then to quantify how good this entangled state is, after we've added noise to it, we look at something called the bipartite coherent information. Well, the bipartite part already tells you that we're interested in the entanglement just between two parties. And the coherent information is a uh, entropic measure um, that quantifies a few things. Or, well, we're interested in the coherent information for two reasons. One of them, it has an interpretation in terms of state merging. And I should be honest, I read up on what state merging is, but I completely forgot about it in the meantime. But maybe more important, the coherent information forms a lower bound on the distillable entanglement. And the distillable entanglement is really an operationally motivated entanglement measure. So we use the coherent information just as a lower bound on this quantity. Now. That was our initial setup. That was the question we wanted to answer when we started this project. And as we worked on this question, we found that 
uh, two notions called contractions and deletions turned out to be very useful to state our results. And so that's actually the thing I want to motivate or to emphasize in this talk. Now with these contractions and deletions, we can do the following. We can express the spectra, meaning just a multi-set of eigenvalues of a state, and in particular of noisy stabilizer states and their marginals. Now, I know that marginals is usually a term that's more reserved for classical information people. So let me emphasize what I mean. A marginal just means you have some state and you take a partial trace over some subsystem. That's what a marginal is. Now we can express these spectra, these eigenvalues, in terms of properties of codes. So somehow we can take a noisy stabilizer state, we look at a subsystem, and it turns out there's a natural code, a stabilizer code associated with that. And somehow the spectra um, can be expressed in terms of that code. Now, every time one has a correspondence like that, one can ask, okay, do, do these two uh, notions inform one another? In particular, if we have good codes, so I have a state and I have a marginal, Does it then mean that the associated state is robust against noise? And that will be a nice thing to have, right? Uh, that would be sort of intu intuitively uh, a sort of pleasing thing to have. And we see, at least numerically, that this is indeed the case. And we can also sort of motivate this from an analytical point of view. Uh, and then thirdly, um, this wasn't our intention at all, but we found that these contractions and deletions were very useful and led to some proofs, simpler proofs of the following facts, simplified proofs. Uh, I'll be not very specific because I don't have the time to talk about this during the talk, but we find simplified proofs related to code equivalences. Now, if people are interested in this, I can explain more about this at the end of the talk. But what I just want to emphasize is that we set out to solve this problem about noisy states. And by developing these tools, we found natural proofs, simplified proofs of things that people have proved before. Um, but again, it's just to emphasize that these tools turned out to be very useful. OK, that was a very general overview and very specific yet at this point. But are there maybe any questions up to now? Uh, sorry, did you already define what a contraction in a deletion is? No, no, not at all. <laughs> oh, okay. No, so this is just to sort of motivate what we can do with these contractions and deletions, and I'll properly define them later on. All right. This is just uh, very much a, an overview, just to give some idea of what I will talk about. Okay, any further questions? All right, let's move on. Okay, I will now give a brief motivation and introduction to the stabilizer formalism. So this is going to be a little bit boring for the experts, um, but maybe, uh, yeah, they might also find some interesting things here. So for the people who haven't seen the stabilizer formalism yet, let me motivate it. The stabilizer formalism appears very naturally when one does, for example, quantum error correction but also a lot of applications in quantum communication, such as sensing and metrology and cryptography. Maybe to mention a nice uh, counterexample or non-example of this point is universal quantum computation. There we find it's the stabilizer formalism in a certain sense is not powerful enough. Okay, uh, but it at least tells you that stabilizer formalism is sufficient for a lot of interesting applications. Now, let me give some examples of stabilizer states, just to show you how ubiquitous they are. On a single qubit, now if you go think back about your quantum info classes, you would always see 
these states to zero in the one state, of course, plus in the minus state, and then the less popular y versions. And these six states, at least in my class, always pop up, and uh, you could already do some quite interesting things with just these six states. You didn't need anything else. Okay, that's just for a single qubit. Uh, let's go to two qubits. Well, when I think of sort of the canonical interesting two qubit state, I think of this state. Zero, zero, plus one, one, where I will ignore normalization. Uh, and of course, we also had these variants where we just add a minus sign. And then we also had these two very similar states. And you might know these as the four bell states. Okay, we can go also to three qubits, and then a very natural candidate is the geta state. Now, all of these states are stabilizer states. And I would say that for a lot of applications, especially in quantum communication, these states that I've listed here already suffice for a lot of applications. Okay, so hopefully I've motivated the stabilizer formalism a bit now. Let me now give a proper definition. And again, I will go through this rather quickly. Um, if there's any questions, please let me know. So to start off with, we need to define the Pauli group. And the Pauli group P sub N is just the set of all Pauli strings. In this case of length N. Okay, so to give an example, something like this is a Pauli string on five qubits. And just to be clear, um, this is not a product between these five Paulis. This is a tensor product. So this identity acts on the first qubit, this x acts on the second qubit, etc. Now, one thing I should mention is that I will be ignoring phases in this talk. Um, so I would I will equate minus x and x, for example. And it turns out one can make this precise. And in a lot of cases, the phases don't matter, or at least one can ignore them when one sort of deals with this appropriately. And that's exactly what I will do in this talk. Okay, one other notion that we'll need is of a stabilizer group. And a stabilizer group is nothing more than a commutative subgroup. So we have some subset of the polys, and we want H to be commutative. And that's the only thing that we need. Now, the expert might complain that I also need to require that minus identity is not in there, but since I'm ignoring phases, that's not a problem. All right, let's give an example. Uh, H given by these four Pauli strings. You can check that these four form a group and that they're commutative. Now, elements all the time. So instead, I will use something called generating sets. And this stabilizer group that I wrote down here, I can also write in a shorter fashion as follows. I write these angular brackets. And what these angular brackets mean is that I take every possible product of these poly strings within these angular brackets. And that sort of generates the whole group. That's where the term generating set comes from. All right. Now, one thing, one concept that we'll need is of a code. It was already in the title, as you could see. So what is a code, actually? Well, at its core, a code is just a subspace. And what is it a subspace of? It is a subspace of our Hilbert space of interest. Well, in our case, our Hilbert space is just c to the power 2 to the power n. And that's the only thing that a code is. It's just a subspace. Now, you might wonder, if you haven't seen codes before, why is this of interest? And let me motivate it as follows. The state in our Hilbert space is a unit vector, which we can equivalently think of as a one-dimensional subspace. 
And so in a certain sense, a code is a very natural generalization of states. Instead of having a one-dimensional subspace, we now consider a two-dimensional subspace or a three-dimensional subspace, et cetera. Now, that is a general code, but we're interested in stabilizer codes. And they are a bit more specific. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a stabilizer group, H, and we're going to look at all small h in h. And this h is of some Pauli string. These Pauli strings act on qubits. So we can let this act on some vector v. Right? This is just some element of our Hilbert space. And we want this vector to be fixed. And we want this for all the Pauli strings in our stabilizer group. Well, the nice thing about this is the fact that h, the small h, is a linear transformation. And you should convince yourself then that all the vectors that are fixed then form a subspace. And this is nice because instead of specifying a subspace um, uh, sort of directly, we can instead specify a subspace by specifying a stabilizer group. So I hand you a stabilizer group, you look at all the Vectors that are fixed, that defines now a subspace. Okay, let me make it a, a bit more concrete by giving an example. Let's say we have the following stabilizer group generated by ZZ. You should convince yourself that this stabilizer group fixes all vectors of the following form. And so we say that this vector space all vectors of this form is the associated code with this stabilizer group here. Okay, if you haven't seen a stabilizer formalism, you might wonder why is this useful? Why should you care about this? Well, the nice thing, uh, well, let me give it a very specific example. If you want to describe an arbitrary state of let's say n qubits, you would need two to the power n complex numbers. Well, this is problematic for two reasons. First of all, there's exponentially many complex numbers. That's not very easy to store or to perform operations on. And they're complex numbers. That's kind of annoying because complex numbers, if you want to store them on a computer, you run into floating point precision issues and stuff like that. Instead, if we can now specify subspaces by their stabilizer groups, then we're working with Pauli strings. And a Pauli string, we can specify with just n bits. And if you go through the analysis, if you want to specify a stabilizer group, you just need order n squared bits. And so we restrict ourselves to the types of subspaces or states that we can consider, but we get a lot of benefit from there. Namely, we get a way more efficient representation that is a lot, convenient to deal, a lot more convenient to deal with. So that's sort of the motivation. And as we saw in the beginning, even though we restrict ourselves to a discrete subset of states or subspaces, a lot of interesting states and subspaces are stabilizer codes or stabilizer states. So we're not losing a lot of application. All right, so that was a very much uh, a very fast run through of the stabilizer formalism. Are there any questions before we really get into the technicalities? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, I wasn't uh, too sure how familiar everyone is with the stabilizer formalism. Maybe everyone is asleep by now. Um, for those people who war were falling asleep, uh, good news. Now I'll sort of assume that you are familiar with the stabilizer formalism. And I'll also, because of that, go through things a little bit more fast. That being said, if something is unclear, please let me know. All right. Um, given the stabilizer group H, um, we can look at something called its dual, and we denote that by this perpendicular symbol. And this group is just going to be the smallest
group or a subgroup, I should say, my bad, of the Pauli strings that commute element wise with H. So I have some subset, I have some uh, stabilizer group, it has some elements in there, and I look at what other Pauli strings commute with all of them. Now, this might be a little bit unfamiliar notation, this uh, perpendicular symbol, um, because uh, for people in quantum info, they might just know this as the group of logical operators. Now, Admittedly, indeed, in the case of stabilizer groups, uh, this distinction doesn't really matter too much, uh, but there are certain generalizations of stabilizer groups, for example, subsystem codes, uh, where this notion is not true anymore. And I'll talk more about this at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, now let's move on to syndromes. The, um, uh, sorry, actually one thing I wanna say, the dual is, like uh, as you would expect from a dual operation, it's an involution. What that means is if I take the dual of some group H and I take the dual again of that, I get back again H. That's a certain, that's a quite a nice property to have. Okay, let's go on to syndromes. Now, quite often how syndromes are defined in the literature is that you say, well, I have some stabilizer code that I implement meaning I measure some stabilizer generators of my code. And then the syndromes is just sort of a bit string that tells me which of my stabilizer generators or my stabilize, stabilizer measurements that I perform um, got triggered or detected an error. Now, I don't like this definition because this definition depends on a generating set that you choose. It depends on a given code, which stabilizers do you actually measure in your experiment? Um, now, one way to deal with this is to say that syndromes are really an equivalent set, or uh, sorry, an equivalence uh, uh, relation, meaning that um, uh, we can define syndromes as the following sets. We define them as cosets of the group of logical operators. So just to be clear, this is a coset notation. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, but you can write this or in set builder notation as follows. These are just all elements of the following form. So I fix some value string P. And then I multiply from the right with all possible elements in the group of logical operators. And now I say that each such set uh, corresponds to a syndrome. Now, why do I say this? Any two elements in the same coset will always trigger the exact same syndromes. And note that this definition is independent of my choice of generating set. And um, this is a more mathematically uh, convenient definition uh, and will also be more useful on us. We'll see in a bit. Any questions on this slide? All right, also still the handwriting still mostly legible. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, um, let's move on to the definition of conjugate stabilizer codes. And in fact, let me actually give some examples. In the beginning, I wrote down these dates. And I suggestively wrote them in pairs like this. There's a good reason for that. We'll see in a bit. Again, I'm just going to write down the examples first. Uh, for two qubits, we saw these four states, the Bell states. Now, these examples are actually examples of something called conjugate stabilizer codes. Let me give a definition of what conjugate stabilizer codes are. 
I have two stabilizer groups, H and H prime. And we say they are conjugate. If we can find a Pauli P such that conjugating one of them gives the other. So we take our stabilizer group H, we conjugate with some Pauli, and then we should get H prime. And then we say that the two groups are conjugate. All right, uh, why is this of interest? Well, we can check that these two states, they correspond to conjugate groups. Same thing for the Bell states. Now, what is not too hard to prove is the following fact. Conjugate codes, and in particular conjugate states, are orthogonal. And that's the reason why, for example, these guys here, 0 and 1, and plus and minus, that they form bases. Same thing for the Bell states. It's well known that these form a, uh, form a basis. And this just follows from this more general fact that conjugate codes are orthogonal. All right, so that's one property. The second property that we need is that, let's say we have two Paulis, E, and we conjugate one stabilizer group with it. And that's the same thing as conjugated with some other Pauli, let's call it Q. Then that's, that's equivalent to the fact that the P and Q, uh, let's see, are in the same coset. I realize now I'm overusing, overloading this P here, but this is just some polystrain P. Let me denote by a bar. So these are just the cosets, and we saw that they corresponded to syndromes. Uh, and this induces a nice equivalence relation on Paulis. Uh, we say the two Paulis are in the same, they are in the same coset, if and only if they sort of map the same code to the same conjugate code. And maybe to make that very explicit, uh, let's say we take our state psi zero, which we can take to be the state zero, zero, plus one, one. Now we can apply, for example, iz to it. So iz will map the state to 0, 0, minus 1, 1. So that can be this state. But that's not the only Pauli string that does that. In fact, any Pauli string in this coset here will map to 0, 0, minus 1, 1. So this, we see that certain Paulis, they have the equivalent action on the same state. And we'll see later on more generally on the same code. So at this point, I haven't yet talked about contraction and deletions. That will happen at the next slide, in case you're wondering. Uh, but before I do that, I need to define projectors. So I will abuse notation a little bit. And for me, a projector is not an actual projector, um, but it will be a normalized projector. So I, I, um, I have some code space, and then the projector onto that code space uh, is not a state because the trace is not equal to one. But if I multiply with the appropriate scalar, I will get something that has trace one, and that I will refer to as the co-projector. Now, for given stabilizer. Stabilizer. So maybe to give a simple example, the zero state written as a density matrix. Check that this is pi plus z divided by two. 
That's just a very All right. Now onto polynoise. Polynoise is just going to be a probabilistic mixture of applying poly strings. In other words, we have some density matrix rho, and we map this as follows. We're going to sum over all possible poly strings. And with some probability, depends on the poly string, we're going to just apply the poly string row. All right. Any questions before we get into uh, the rest of the talk? All right. In that case, let's move on. So <laughs> up until this point, I've been uh, defining a lot of things, and that's just mostly to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, but you know, usually in talks that I attend, I, I quite often forget again what was the initial intent. So let me repeat that again here. We have some stabilizer state that is perfect initially, but then we add some Pauli noise on top of it. And then we want to understand this noisy density matrix, and in particular, it's marginals. And the reason why we're interested in this is because we want to calculate the coherent information here. That's this quantity. And we can see it's a function of the entropy of the reduced system on Bob's side minus the entropy of the total system. Now, so if you want to understand this quantity, you should understand the spectra of marginals of noisy stabilizer states. Now, as soon as we can do that, we can basically calculate any other entropic quantity that just depends on the spectra of the marginals. So maybe to give some examples, um, the mutual information is a nice example, or the reversed coherent information. These are all quantities that just depend on the entropies of marginals. All right. Uh, can I ask yes. something? Yes, please. Uh, so here, because this this quantity is not symmetric, right? So when exactly. you're right with Bob, so you mean that the noise is on Bob's side? Is that correct? Ah, uh, so let me see if I understand the question correctly. So, well, first of all, indeed, this quantity is not not symmetric, in the sense that it sort of favors Bob. We are only looking at Bob's reduced uh, on the reduced system on Bob's side and not looking on the reduced system, system on Alice's side. <laughs> so in that sense, indeed, this quantity is not symmetric, um, which is a little bit weird when one, when one thinks of entanglement measures, one thinks of sort of things that should be invariant under permuting the, the, the parties. Um, there's several ways to reason about this. Um, well, for one, there's something called the reverse coherent information, where you sort of swap the role of Alice and Bob. Um, and one other reason to motivate this coherent information is that it first appeared in the context of one-way uh, communication. So this is a type of setting where you say, okay, mm -hmm. Alice and Bob, they can maybe share some entangled state, but then only Alice is allowed to communicate to Bob. And so the coherent mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. somehow says something about how well one can, um, if I remember correctly, do uh, distillation or, or uh, some some task, but with this restriction that Alice can only communicate to Bob. And you can already tell from this setting that we're already breaking the symmetry. Alice is very different from Bob. Hmm. Does that give a motivation now for why we see this asymmetry? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I was just thinking like at least like in a in some application or some practical setting, uh, at yeah. least it would be clear that Alice and Bob have different roles, and you would know whether to compute this uh, first quantity, like, yeah, for Alice or for Bob, it will be clear. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Now, I should mention that our main motivation was to get an upper bound, sorry, a lower bound on the distillable entanglement, which this coherent information is. And there, we, since the distillable entanglement does not favor uh, Alice or Bob, uh, we can we can choose both of them. We can choose either uh, the reversed version or the version I wrote down here, and we can take the maximum, whichever gives the tightest lower bound. Yeah, I think in that case, it makes sense to take that, yes. 
All right. Uh, let's move on to contractures and deletions. Um, okay, let's say we have a state as follows, the one I've written down here. And I've just now written it down as some triangle. Uh, for the experts, this will really correspond to a triangle graph state. But in case you, you don't know what a graph state is, don't worry. It is just some stabilizer state that has this stabilizer group. Now, let me define deletions. I'm going to perform a deletion on qubit one. Well, what that means is we're going to take our stabilizer group here. We're going to look at all the entries in there and just toss away the first one. So to make that concrete, here we have ZZX in our stabilizer group. And we now map this just to ZX because we threw away the first one. Similarly, if we look at, let's say, YIY, then we see that gets mapped to just IY because we threw away the first Y. All right, that seems simple enough. We just uh, throw away some entries. Um, and again, for the specific case where we delete the first qubit. What is contraction? Oh, oh, sorry, here's the definition of deletion in case you're interested. Uh, but I think it totally is sort of clear what deletion does. Let's move on to contraction, which is a bit more involved. We look at our whole stabilizer group H here, and we're going to take only the elements that have an identity on all the qubits that we contract on. Okay, what does that mean? If we contract just on qubit one, then you can see that these colored strings here, they are the only ones that have an identity on the first qubit. So those are the only ones we're going to keep. Now, just like with deletion, we are going to remove the first entry. And so we see that after contracting on one, we see that this group H gets mapped to this guy here. One thing you can see is that I use this notation, these uh, backwards and forward slashes to indicate deletion and contraction. All right, and one can formally write down a definition of contraction. But again, I hopefully it's clear what this contraction uh, means. Now, when one looks at this, one thing you might notice is that this group here is a stabilizer group. That's not too hard to check. I mean, there's just one non identity element in there. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting is that if you look at all the poly strings here, they commute exactly with yy and of course with identity uh, now the question is is this a coincidence uh, this is in fact not a coincidence um, we find that when you take a stabilizer group of a state for example this guy here this state and you now do contraction on a set of qubits then you will always end up with some stabilizer group if on the other hand, you now performed deletion on those qubits that you previously contracted on. Then you end up with the group of logical operators of that stabilizer group. And so this is kind of nice. Instead of thinking of our stabilizer group and our group of logical operators as sort of two distinct things, we see that they're sort of related through this larger state. Now in the paper, uh, we show this, that this, uh, this is indeed true. Uh, but we also show that a, um, we also show in the paper that every stabilizer group arises in this fashion. So every code that you can think of, every stabilizer code at least, uh, you can think of as first thinking of some larger state and then contracting on some subset of qubits. Any questions about this? Uh, I have a sort of mathematical question. Sure. So you define the contraction with respect to the identity. But I imagine there's nothing special about the identity. I could have contracted the X, the Y, or the Z. Uh, but is there anything particular that you want to do the contraction with the identity? Yes, because in that case, I have this correspondence that they correspond to a stabilizer, uh, to the stabilizer group of some code. Um, 
maybe to give some intuition. Um, so let me see, do I have it here? Yes. Um, what you can see here is uh, I took, for example, this element, and now I delete the first x. So I said, OK, that gets mapped to here, to this z set here. But I also put this x sub l here. Now, what this x sub l means, it's just a part that I deleted. It's exactly this x here. And it turns out that this deletion also tells you what, how you should interpret that, uh, that logical operator as. Because here, this is just some, this is some Pauli on my physical qubits, but it tells me that I should interpret it as a logical operation on my qubits. So to come back to your question, if you say, oh, I only want to keep those that have an X, like this, for example, and this guy, then we see that those are exactly the guys that act as logical axes. So one can do that, indeed. One can say, I'm only going to keep those that have an X. Um, but then one sort of only preserves the logical axis. But in my case, I'm interested in the stabilizers. So I want to have the logical <laughs> identities. Um, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Maybe one other observation that might be of interest to you is, um, is measurements. If I measure, uh, let's say, qubit X, uh, sorry, qubit one in X, then the new group that I end up with corresponds to those polys that have only an identity or an X on that first qubit. So that's a little bit of a mixture of what I described and what you described. Uh, instead of just keeping identity or X, mm -hmm. you keep you know, you know, the poly strings that have well identity or X, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. I also want to use this slide to sort of give some motivations why I, I like this idea very much of thinking this way about codes. When I first learned about uh, stabilizer codes, people would say, okay, we have a bunch of physical qubits, and uh, sort of somewhere inside of those qubits, we encode our information. So our logical qubits are sort of somewhere in those qubits, which is true, but I never really found it intuitive. Now, what I like about this picture is that I can sort of pin, I can point at my logical qubit. It turns out that we can really think of this qubit on which we do contractions and deletions as our logical qubit. Let me motivate this. This stabilizer state here has x, z, z as a stabilizer, as we can see here. And so we see that x applying x, z, z to the state is the same thing as applying nothing. OK, one thing I can do is then just remove this x to the left-hand side and add it to the right-hand side. And this is sort of what, how, we, how we think of, of logical operations. We perform, for example, z, z on our physical qubits, qubits 2 and 3. And we see that that's the same thing as performing a logical x on qubit one. But here in this case, since I'm not really thinking of my logical qubit as sort of being an actual physical qubit, I, I find it personally easier to reason about. So that's sort of the power behind this, uh, this technique. All right, if there's no questions, then, uh, then let's move on. Um, we have now these contractions and deletions, and we now sort of have all the tools necessary to actually answer our question, namely to understand the spectra of noisy states. Now, uh, one thing I want to focus on is the case of, um, uh, of just the marginal on Bob side. The noisy total state is a little bit simpler to understand, so I'll just focus on the marginal on Bob side. Now, first of all, uh, since we're only applying single qubit noise, tracing out and applying the noise, they commute. So I'm first going to trace out and then apply the noise. That will be more convenient for us. Now I'm going to use the observation that the trace of the identity matrix is two, while the trace of the other three poly matrices is zero. Using this, we first write down our total state, row AB. And in the case of it being perfect, we know it is a code projector. 
That means we can write it as a sum of its Pauli elements like this. And then using linearity, we can pull the partial trace inside of the sum as we do here. And so again, this gives us now the state on Bob's side before we apply noise. Well, now we use the fact that we're taking a partial trace, as we saw here, on, uh, on a Pauli strain. But we see from here that as soon as we have one non-identity Pauli, that term will vanish. And so, in fact, the only terms that will survive after a partial trace are the ones that have all identities on Alice's side. But that's exactly what contraction is. So we see that rho b is a sum over Pauli elements in the stabilizer group H contract A. And by definition, that's the, the following code projector. Now, this is again the case without noise. So let's apply some noise. And like I said, we are going to apply Pauli noise. So with some probability, we're going to apply a Pauli string. Now, one thing that we know is that when we apply Paulis to coprojectors, we end up always with conjugate coprojectors. And when we apply noise, this means we have some convex mixture of these conjugate coprojectors. Um, and the nice thing is that all of these states are orthogonal, or all these code spaces are orthogonal. So we really get the diagonalization for free because we already know the basis in which these, the state is diagonalized in. And so for each coset, P times H dual, uh, we get a conjugate coprojector. And the probability that we get mapped to that coprojector is just the probability that we apply element in a given coset. So we start off with some coprojector of rho uh, uh, H contract A. We now start applying Paulis. And for each Pauli in this coset here, we get mapped to this, co uh, this conjugate coprojector. So if we want to calculate the probability that we end up here, we should just calculate the probability of applying all the Paulis in that coset. At this point, we can now use this interpretation of cosets in terms of syndromes. The probability that we get mapped to this coprojector here is just the probability of seeing that associated syndrome. Now this is nice because each projector, each conjugate code projector already has entropy K because we project on some space of, uh, of, uh, of size two to the power K. But then we also have this probability distribution over the different uh, conjugate code projectors. But like I said before, this is given by the entropy of the syndromes, meaning, you know, if you run your experiment, you observe the probability distribution of seeing your different syndromes, and it's then the entropy of that observed probability distribution that appears here. Now, I find this interesting for, uh, for the following reason. The syndrome entropy is a, one of, is a very well-studied uh, object and was already studied by uh, Gallagher when he came up with uh, classical LWC codes. So we can sort of relate these, uh, the noise and stabilizer states with the syndrome entropy of these associated codes. One thing that I find quite nice that I didn't really talk about is the following setting. We can consider the case where only Bob's qubits uh, experience noise. In that case, we get a very nice expression for the entropy of the total system. Namely, it's given by the syndrome entropy of the dual code, so where we now delete on A. Now, if you think about this, this might seem a little bit weird because H delete A, as we saw before, is a group of logical operators. It's not a stabilizer group. It, it doesn't commute. There's non commuted uh, there's elements in it that don't commute. Um, however, one can still interpret this group of logical operators as a type of classical linear code. And it's exactly the syndrome entropy of this classical linear code that determines the entropy of the total state. 
which I think is a very interesting correspondence. Okay, um, so using these techniques, we can actually calculate this coherent information analytically. Um, so let's investigate a little bit. Let's say we take a bell pair and we apply the polarizing noise to both sides of the qubits or on all the qubits. And we have some depolarizing noise that we apply with some parameter lambda. Now, we can also look at a state that is associated with the five qubit code, the simplest uh, non-trivial error correction code. And as we see, the coherent information for the five qubit code is indeed larger. And so we indeed see that, okay, states with sort of good associated codes are more robust. Well, let's double check that intuition. Let's take a state corresponding to the repetition code on seven bits. And now we see that that performs very bad. It's this green line here. Well, why is this? It's because the repetition code is a very bad quantum code. It is a good classical code in the sense that it's the best N1 code, but as a quantum code, it's very bad. And that's exactly what we see here. We can also go to more complex codes where we encode uh, where do you, sorry, we can also go to states that have good associated codes with higher uh, number of logical qubits. And then we see, okay, indeed for low noise, we see that we end up with higher coherent information here on the left, on the right hand side. Now, and we see also that these states are quite robust, but of course there's these crossing points and that's unfortunately a general feature, you know, a given uh, trying to find an optimal state or an optimal code for some specific set of parameters is just a hard problem, a hard optimization problem. Okay, so maybe to, uh, to summarize, uh, we found a way to analytically think about uh, entropies and, mar and entropies of marginals of noisy stabilizer states. And through this, we use these contractions and deletions. And, and it turns out that they simplify a lot of the uh, calculations. Um, furthermore, these contractions and deletions, I didn't have the time to talk too much about it here. Um, they simplified some proofs uh, previously known on uh, things related to stabilizer code equivalences. Uh, you should see the paper uh, about that. I actually put an updated, updated version of the paper online today, so please check that out. Um, and in fact, one thing I also mentioned is that these contractions and deletions um, they're quite a powerful tool, and because of that, they also extend to more sort of exotic codes like subsystem and floquet codes. And so this is something that I'm currently working on uh, with a collaborator. Um, and then a further follow-up question is, okay, uh, all this is interesting, but we specialize now to the bipartite case. And it becomes a lot harder when you start looking at the multipartite case. Multipartite entanglement is obviously harder than bipartite entanglement. Uh, and so there's still a lot of things to explore there. It's not obvious at all how to find robust uh, stabilizer states in the multi-partite setting. One thing that I am particularly interested in about is, is this mutual information. Uh, there is a multi-partite generalization, and it turns out there's some recent work that interprets this quantity in terms of something called the Euler characteristic. And so there's a lot of interesting uh, exploration being done there, especially with respect to entanglement cohomology that I hope these tools can be applied for. Okay, with all of that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, please uh, let me know. Okay, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, very informative talk. So anyone who has questions, uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask the questions. Maybe I can go first. Uh, hello. Hi. Ah. Wait, am I not hearing anyone? I, I can hear you at least. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. I mean, yeah, I find this very nice, like when you do this uh, contraction uh, where, so for the contraction, there's a code and the division tells you sort of the logical operators of this code, right? Okay. Uh, but what the thing that you showed is for like, if you delete or contract on one qubit, I suppose mm -hmm. it's to totally general, right? So if I have 
if I have, do it on more qubits, then sort of the interpretation of the logical operators will be exactly depending on where I delete or contract. So, okay, so if I understand your question correctly, um, you say not only do I need to specify a state, but it's also important which qubits I do the contraction and deletion on, right? Is that correct? Uh, in some sense, yeah, that would be sort of one way to interpret it. <laughs> so let's see, let me uh, go back a few slides. So, yeah, so here, because like we, you only show like the deletion on one qubit, mm -hmm. the first one. So, yeah. I mean, then, then it will tell me whether it's a logical X or Z, right? So yep. now if I do it on more qubits, if I was looking at an example with more qubits, so the, the interpretation goes through. So if I delete it on the qubits that previously was XZ, then I'm getting sort of the logical operators for XZ. Is that is yep. that the correct way to see it? Exactly, yeah. Oh, oh, yep. okay, okay, I see. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So in, in general, if you have a, um, if you have a, Stabilizer group. Uh, let me use some notation that I haven't introduced before, but hopefully it's clear. We can also define deletion on a single element. And uh, so H is just some poly string. And I can do deletion on some subset, let's call it V, uh, which will give me some poly string. And um, actually, let me write it down like this. I have here some subset V, here some V prime. And I think of my V prime qubits as my physical qubits. Now I have some entanglement here, something like this, I don't know. And one thing I can do is I can take some stabilizer H of my total state, I delete V. Mm -hmm. And now this here acts as H, but now contract on V prime. Sorry, not mm. contract, uh, delete. Sorry. And that's exactly wow. the example that uh, that you uh, specified. Like if you have, let's say, X, Z on the first two qubits and then something else on the rest, <laughs> then deleting the first two qubits gives me the physical operations that I need to do to implement a logical X set. That all carries. <laughs> ah, okay, ah, that's very nice. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's it, it, this this contraction and deletion does a lot of bookkeeping that I am usually very bad with. So I find it's a very convenient tool to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I should let other people ask questions too. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for the very nice, uh, interesting talk. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I understand quite correctly, but you uh, basically rely on some uh, orthogonality between different codes uh, if you apply like different uh, operation like error syndrome, but uh, is the if you consider other noise model, how 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 do you construct this kind of uh, orthogonality between different call space? Is that yes. doable? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, as soon as one has something different from Pauli noise, then this breaks down. Um, one loses this idea of well, first of all, the conjugate codes will not be orthogonal anymore. Uh, and things just become a lot more messy because of that. Um, so one thing that one could try to do, and I've tried to look into this, let's say, okay, well, I know that uh, Pauli matrices form a basis of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of matrices. So maybe one thing that I could do is say, okay, if I apply some Krauss operator, I first expand that in the Pauli basis, then apply that, and then sort of keep track of how that gets mapped. One could do things like that, but it becomes, one loses a lot of nice structure. And I don't think in general that there's then anything nice to say. I see. 
Uh, so thank thank you. Uh, so another question is about I I I like I like the idea that you make use of the mutual information idea here. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure uh, the mutual information of this uh, uh, bipartite entanglement is between uh, logical and physical qubit, or is between Alice and Bao. It's wh what's the bipartite you're using here? I'm not so quite clear. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I understand the, the last question about the mutual information. Um... Let's see. So let's. Um, so you said okay, we're in the bipartite setting, and then, then, then I wasn't sure anymore um, about your question. So you your uh, bipartite between Eddie's and Bob, or is there any trick that you can uh, like uh, bipartite like between? Mm -hmm the logical and physical cube because you you make use of the the deletion between logical and physical is that qubit is that your interpretation okay so i think also your question is about the mutual information how we can extend it to the multipartite case or is that not part of your question uh probably that is one 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 extension of my question yeah okay so let me answer that one because that one I, I know how to answer. Then maybe we can circle back to your previous question. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so of course, what I've talked about here is mostly motivated for the bipartite setting. But the important part is that we can calculate entropies of noisy marginals. And as soon as we can do that, then if we have some state like, uh, let's say, rho, a, B, C, this might be tripartite. Then using our trick, we can just say, well, uh, we can calculate rho A, B by just grouping A and B together and then calculate the noisy marginal. Um, and then separately, we can also calculate the uh, noisy marginal on rho A by grouping B and C together and tracing these, those out. And so as long as we can specify our mutual information in terms of or any entropic quantity for that matter, in terms of sums of entropies of marginals, then we can do that with the tools we've developed here. Now, one part where it becomes a little bit harder is that in this talk, I sort of motivated that states with good codes associated to them are robust. Now, that's still true in the multipartite case, um, at least presumably, but now the thing is, is that for every bipartition, you now get a different code. And so we want to find a state that across a lot of bipartitions induces a good code. Now that is to my, that's, that sounds to me like a very hard optimization problem. And I think that's at least where one of the differences come, uh, comes into play. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe we can go back to your first question. Uh, probably I will rephrase my question. Uh, when you use the entanglement entropy, uh, the, the, the bipartite entanglement you, you calculate, what's the, uh, how to say, um, you, you try to get the, the probability distribution between mm -hmm. different, uh, possibility or what's the assumption behind that you are using them to do the correction is there any assumption there because they give you some minimum requirement of the entropy or something i'm not sure if uh, i as correctly uh let's see so you mentioned the term correction i wasn't sure what you meant here with correction um because in this case, Alice and Bob just have a state, noise is applied to them, and then they just ask what is the entanglement between them. Mm -hmm. um, then how 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 does it help uh, to uh, to get the spectrum? Why why you can get the spectrum if you only know the the inf mutual information? Oh, if sorry. Okay, uh, so we can calculate the mutual information or for example, the coherent information, when we know the spectrum. 
and the spectrum is um, given by the probability distribution of seeing a syndrome for that associated code. Um, oh, so I if see. I go, if I go to this slide here, uh, this is a good point. I sort of skipped over this part. Here I said, oh, we have, uh, you know, the probability of seeing, of ending up in a certain co-projector, let's say this guy here, is, uh, is the probability that we'll see that associated syndrome. And in my case, I was interested in, okay, what is the, uh, the, uh, the entropy? So that's why I immediately moved on to the syndrome entropy. Um, but the spectrum is just given by the probability distribution of seeing different syndromes for that code. So you must do many experiments to get the probability distribution, right? Yes, and of I course, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 they wouldn't let me close to uh, any quantum computer of any shape. Um, so even if you want to do this numerically, one runs into the issue that calculating these probabilities is still very hard. In fact, one could show that calculating just a single probability of this probability distribution is, uh, is let me see, uh, Sharpie complete. So there's no good hope of really calculating these things analytically for very large codes, just because the associate problem is really hard. Um, but at least it gives us some framework. It tells us sort of where these numbers come from instead of, you know, write out the whole, writing out the whole density matrix and doing diagonalization. Um, so the, still, these quantities are, are still very hard to calculate. Mm, I see, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's very nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure, by all means. Yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe for clarification, um, so here in the slide, when you do a partial trace over A on your state row AB, you get row B. And you're saying that yeah. um, by the addition, you can find um, the stabilizer group of this, uh, of row B. So let's see. Uh, let me try to find a bit more space. Uh, should have added an additional slide. Uh, actually, let me just go here. Um, so we have, a G given by I, and I claimed that this guy is proportional to the sum of its stabilizers. And this is a fun thing to check. Um, now we can do a partial trace of row AB. And so if we plug that in, see that this is proportional to, right, there needs to be an A here, trace of A sum over H. Then I say, okay, we can pull the trace, the partial trace inside. That's linearity. Um, and now my claim is, is that if I take the partial trace of some Pauli string, I will get zero if there's any Pauli on A on one of the qubits on Alice that has a non-identity in them. And because of that, the only terms that will survive here are exactly those poly, uh, or those, let me use slightly different notation, those H primes, such that this is an A contract A. Because H contract A are exactly those poly strings that have identity on all of A. Oh, no, I see. Thank you. But um, so, is there also a correspondence to deletion? Like, what ah, do you yes. do on your global state? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this is a good point. 
Um, we can now ask, given the state, let's write this down as row B, uh, we can now wonder which, for which H, actually, let me use K because I'm using H already too much, for which K, where K is a polystring, do we have that applying K to row B gives me row B again. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that if K is uh, in the group, in H contract A, then this happens. Uh, the idea is because uh, it, it will commute with all the elements. And in fact, we see that as soon as we can pull K through row B, then it will cancel here with the inverse. And we see that here we have just a sum of Pauli strings. So if K commutes with H prime, with all of the H primes, I can pull it through. In other words, we're asking what are the, uh, what are the elements that commute with all the elements in H uh, contract A? Now, by definition, this is just H delete A. So this is where deletion comes into play. I see, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, maybe another question. Like, uh -huh. maybe this is a bit irrelevant, but I was thinking, like, if you now have a pure tripartite thing, uh -huh. and um, you're also doing, like, partial trace, and you're getting your A, B, and A, C marginal. So is it enough to start from these two marginals and you get um, a unique um, tripartite global state by your technique? Let's, like, let's see if maybe, I understand your question correctly. Yeah. So you said we have some uh, tripartite states. So let's say there's some qubits uh, here. We have some qubits here and maybe just two qubits here. Corresponding okay. to A, B, and C. And now... Exactly. Let me see, you said we take marginals like this? Yeah, now you only know A, B, and A, C. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that you can have only one compatible A, B, C? Um, um, and so, sorry, just, uh, just to be clear, when you say um, you take the marginals, you know both A and B, C? Um, no, it's like you only know the bipartite marginal AB and also the bipartite marginal AC. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so I, my, I, I don't have a have... answer to you. I think in general the question is no. Okay. This might be different for stabilizer states, um, but your question is closely related to something called the. Uh, let me see. I think it's called the extension problem or, ah, no, sorry. I know what it's called. It's called the, uh, the quantum, uh, quantum marginal problem. And I put quantum between brackets because this is already a problem, uh, very well studied in classical information theory. And the question is given a set of marginals, can I, is it compatible with some larger probability distribution? And in fact, can I then find that probability distribution? Um, I don't claim to know all the results in this, uh, in this subfield, but uh, I think at least for, just to dive into some interesting literature, I think this would be the, the thing to search for. Okay, thank you. Right. So I don't know if there's any more questions. Uh, I I just want one small thing I wanted to ask. Sure. Uh, sure. So in your technique, you you are able to get this coherent information or mutual information because you know the spectra. Yeah. Or so like actually you could compute any function of the spectra. Or exactly. is it the case that, oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah. I was wondering whether it's sort of like 
some function of the spectra that allows you to compute the coherent information, which are information. But you do actually have information of the spectra itself. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we can calculate things like the mutual information, because uh, the mutual information is just the sum of the entropy of the total state mm -hmm. uh, and minus the entropy of the two marginals, so on row A and row B. Or with a minus sign, I always forget the two, uh, which one, but uh, we can also calculate that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, since we can calculate the entropy, we can also calculate stuff like relative entropies. Um, in particular, not only do we have the spectra, we also know the, the associated basis. We have an explicit diagonalization uh, because we know which, uh -huh. uh, how our co-projectors look like. So we can calculate also stuff like relative entropies that require you to know the diagonalization.